So first of all, my name is Philip Heidson. I'm a 20 year procurement practitioner and also a founder and managing director of a company called Art of Procurement. And I'm really, really honored today to be facilitating this book launch. Um, the book in question, as you can see from all the author's backgrounds is Profit from Procurement, how to add 30% to your bottom line by breaking down silos and it's published by Wiley. And so in our book launch today, I'm joined by three executives of Officio. I'm joined by Alex Klein, who's COO and co-founder. I'm joined by Simon Watson and Jose Oliveira, who are both vice presidents and all of them now can add published authors to their LinkedIn profiles. So Alex, Simon, <clears throat> Jose, thank you very much for joining us today. Now, over the course of the next 50 minutes or so, I have a number of questions to dig into uh, from the book for Alex, Simon, and Jose. We received a lot of questions in advance as well. So I'm going to be asking some questions that we got from registrants for the session. But of course, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to just pop those into the Q&A box that you see in Zoom. Those are gonna come directly to me. Um, I'll be your voice today. And as I can jump in with questions that you're asking me, I'll be doing that. So please don't be shy. Uh, pop those questions into the Q&A box um, as we go through the conversation. So let's get started, Alex. I'm going to put you on the hot seat, first of all. Um, I wonder if you could just share for everybody who's joined us today a little bit of an elevator pitch for the book uh, and perhaps some of the key themes that you wanted to really bring out. Sure, sure. Um, I mean, the basic premise of the book is that, you know, procurement is an enormous profitability lever. Uh, it influences typically over 50% of a company's costs. And if you do it right, you know, you can add upwards of a third uh, to, your, to your profit margin. Um, however, the vast majority of companies have not fully exploited uh, procurement's potential. Very few companies in select sectors um, are truly at best practice. Um, and are truly getting full value out of procurement. So the book asks, you know, why is that, uh, first of all? And secondly, you know, what do we need to do um, to, to get it right and, and, and to unleash the full impact of procurement? Um, in terms of themes, I mean, there's a number of themes that run through the book. The most important one is probably cross-functionality. Um, so most companies are not at best practice because they don't operate well cross-functionally. Um, Procurement is not something that can be done by the function operating out of a silo. Uh, it needs the CEO, the CFO, and the rest of the business uh, mm -hmm. to join in um, to make it work. Uh, and, and that's why, you know, we say this is not a book just for procurement people. It, it's for the entire C-suite, or it's for anyone that wants to make a, a, a commercial splash with, with procurement. Um, the second theme that runs across the book is, is that savings are paramount. Um, you know, savings are the bread and butter of, of, of a procurement function. Savings are expected by the business. And, you know, the procurement function should, do, should strive to do more than just deliver savings. But we see a lot of companies that are trying to run uh, before they can walk. So, you know, get the basics right. Make sure you're delivering commercially to the business. And then from there, um, adopt other agendas uh, beyond savings. So those are a couple of the themes that run across the book. Now, you mentioned that um, the book isn't just um, written for procurement professionals. So I wonder if you could just expand upon that. You know, you're thinking of the audience that spans both procurement and non-procurement readers. Yeah, I mean, the, the book is pitched at, uh, I guess, at the executive level, at, at the C-suite. Um, and, you know, the prime reader is going to be the chief procurement officer. Um, but we're looking to capture the rest of the C-suite because as I said, um, you know, that CPO needs the full engagement, the full sponsorship of the, particularly the CEO and the CFO, um, but also the, the, the various heads of, of, of the business units. So the book is not um, too technical. It's, it's not, you know, purely for procurement geeks. Um, it's written in, in standard language, if you like. And it tries to uh, drum up enthusiasm for procurement across, you know, across the C-suite. So it's fair to say from a procurement, uh, if somebody's listening to this who's in procurement function today, you know, this is an opportunity as well to kind of help. I don't want to use the word educate because um, 
I, I just don't know if that's kind of the right mindset in terms of our stakeholders, but to help our stakeholders see what the after possible is for procurement and perhaps help them open some eyes that uh, when they see what they can expect from their procurement teams. Absolutely. And, and what can they do to, to make procurement successful? Right? Mm -hmm. what, what part do they need to play? Um, so, Simon, I've got a question for you. So why now? Like, what's the burning platform that, um, you know, that, that made that really all three of you decide, you know, this is something we want to invest the time in now to, to create and that this is a time for procurement where these messages could be really impactful? Yeah. Well, when we wrote the book, we couldn't travel anywhere, so we had to have something to do. <laughs> um, no, I mean, in all seriousness, obviously, we, we're just hopefully now coming out the other end of a of, of a crisis, you know, with 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 COVID and the pandemic. And it's it's not the only crisis that the world has faced in, in recent years. Um, you know, whether whether it's the financial crisis as well, about twelve years ago. But what we see um, is that it's those businesses that have got on top of procurement, got on top of their suppliers, got on top of their data that do procurement well in the ways that Alex was describing there, um, that are best positioned to weather storms that come along like COVID that are obviously unexpected and you never know when it's going to happen. Um, you know, this, this book is not about COVID, but we, we see it as, um, you know, th that a lot of companies have looked at their suppliers, um, their supply base, their costs, in this crisis and for those that have not done the basics around um, understanding their spend, understanding who their suppliers are, um, having the right kind of skills in procurement, that they really struggle and there's a lot of firefighting and, and, and sort of panic going on. Um, you know, we, we thought this was a good opportunity to, to, to reset procurement now and say, look, you know, this has happened a few times. It, it is something that you need to fix when this, you know, it's a roof that you need to fix when the sun is shining. Um, and, and, and that's why we, we thought it was a good time to, to write this book. Um, now, now, Jose, I want to just kind of add on that. Do you see that now is a time in procurement that if you get procurement right and, and whatever getting it right means, we're going to talk about a little bit about strategies and tactics later. But if you are really um, are able to invest in creating a procurement capability that does have perhaps more of an impact than in the past, is that something that there's demand within the C-suite for? Are you seeing demand within a business for good or um, great procurement teams? I think that's partly why we wrote the book is that um, we do see demand in, in some great organizations, but as a rule, we don't see it. Um, and I don't know what it is, if it's maybe the way that procurement expresses uh, itself with, with other business stakeholders. Um, that it seems that there's a bit of a barrier in understanding what good looks like, what's acceptable, and and what how do I establish procurement uh, within the company within enterprise wide. Um, so you know, obviously there are a lot of themes and a lot of topics in in, in, in the book, and but the, the really one of the probably the single most important factor between a good and a great procurement team is is the ecosystem, the context, and in particular how sponsors nurture, understand, and um, you know, are, are synced in to what is needed to, be, to, to deliver and to have really good results. And, and so that, that executive sponsorship, do you find that, that there are great procurement teams without that sponsorship or that's really a requisite? No, I, th I think it's you know, at, le at least half of the job and probably more is the ability of the, the leadership of procurement teams to be able to articulate their needs, their requirements, the trade-offs, uh, and and also their narrative and 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 the way they need to work with the business. It's it's um, you know I think it's it's probably a testament that there are not a lot of procurement books out there, uh, at least not published by the the major publishing companies. It's like we haven't quite cracked the the spiel, quite quite cracked the you know what are the headlines around procurement for it, for procurement to be successful, right? And I think that's something that all of us in procurement need to work on. Yeah, and it's actually one of the things that we've, we've tried to do in the book is, is to help with that whole language piece. And, you know, in one of the, the chapters we talk about, um, you know, the language that procurement often uses with the business, it's not always a language that, that other stakeholders understand or, right. or, or much care about. And being able to, you know, having a, a procurement leadership in a team that is able to translate what the business 
uh, wants and is able to translate what it is they're doing into what the business wants are those ones that get the most traction and are the most successful. Um, and it, you know, we didn't put on the front cover, you know, get 30% savings because that word savings, you know, what does that mean? Um, you know, we, we, we believe we need to talk the language of the business as, as procurement people. Do you find that that's Simon, uh, Simon somewhere where we get stuck and that it, we're not necessarily able to really articulate well the value and the impact that procurement has because we're speaking in savings terms or cost avoidance terms or you know terminology that either the business doesn't understand or that they're afraid of almost i think so definitely but what i've learned and and what we've tried to articulate in the book as well is that it's actually a journey that, that people need to go on i think so you know when you ask you know when a procurement function is starting to try to get some traction you know it probably does need to fit in with what the finance uh, view of a, of a of a the financial contribution is you know a saving against a budget it's very visible there is a there is a very tangible price reduction against the price we paid last year um, but it's about building the trust through acts like that which then gives you know people confidence that actually there's there's more value here than just a price reduction yeah we can actually see that procurement could uh, help us to avoid cost. It, it could ultimately help us to generate revenue, right? And, and these are places that procurement can and should go. Um, but we need to get those basics right and, and get the confidence first of the business. Um, just while uh, you know, I'm kind of talking to you on this theme, Simon, I think one of the things that you wrote uh, a chapter about in the book was about setting the vision, like articulating the vision, inspiring the after possible. How can we as procurement leaders go about doing that both for our teams, but also as we've talked about that executive sponsorship being so important, how can we do that for our C-suite to inspire them to realize what they can ask for and what they can expect from a procurement team? Yeah, I think there's a couple of elements to it. I would say the first one is, and apologies to go back to the theme, but we, we will return to it a couple of times, I imagine, is that we do need to, um, to get some credibility. So there's no point in going and, and selling this vision of procurement in a company that doesn't believe in procurement, it doesn't have, um, you know, any kind of understanding really of how procurement can, can add value, um, you know, whether it's to things like, um, you know, product development or sustainability or whatever else is important to the business. Um, so I think getting that credibility, being seen as a competent partner that can deliver a cost benefit initially um, gives procurement the remit and the, the license to then go and start talking about well you know how we've you know we, we've, we've run some strategic sourcing events and we've managed to you know get visibility over our, uh, our supplier base in terms of their cost and capability well couldn't we take that a step further and and start to see what the sustainability score for example is of our supply base and and other things so it's a very kind of you know, it's, it's, it's a logical progression for procurement. Um, and so I think that's one way, but I do think there needs to be an element of, of vision here that we need to sell um, and a kind of blue sky thinking. Um, and in the book, we do talk about how procurement in particular in areas of, of innovation, supply management. Um, also, when we get into technology, we talk about how procurement actually can start to get itself out of the way of the business um, and start to play a more strategic role uh, you know, uh, sort of advising rather than the operational handle churning. Um, so I think there's a couple of ways that procurement can go about it. And, and, and Simon mentioned the word remit, which, which is a key word, you know, throughout the book, um, in that procurement does need to be given the right remit. Um, if the remit of procurement is to come in at the last minute and finalize contracts and squeeze out another 2%, then it will deliver against that remit. Mm -hmm. um, if the remit is to optimize the company's cost base, then hopefully it will try to deliver against that remit. Um, but the point here is, you know, A, it needs to be given the remit, but B, it then needs to make sure it delivers against that remit. Yeah. If it gets that remit and doesn't deliver, then that's not gonna last long. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's what we've seen in, in most companies we go into, um, either the remit isn't given or the remit has been given but hasn't been fulfilled and there's, there's a vicious cycle. Yeah, it's like, here we go again. You, you get in front of all your stakeholders and you're telling them this time it's going to be different. And there's a lot of skepticism that, well, we've been down this road before and nothing really changed. 
Absolutely. And procurement is only going to get the respect it deserves um, by, by owning it at the end of the day. Now, when you talk to a lot of um, uh, C-suite outside of procurement and you're making the case for an investment in procurement, like what are some of the objections that you often hear? I mean, the, the, the big one is around savings, right? How real are the savings and are these supposed savings, you know, really going to hit the bottom line? Um, and there's a lot of bad experience out there with regards to, you know, C CPOs promising the world in terms of savings and then the CFO at the end of the year unwinding it all and realizing that only a small fraction of, of what was promised has actually flown through to the, to the bottom line. Um, that's a huge problem in procurement. It's, it's something that's solvable. Um, but in most companies, there's a, there's a legacy of, of distrust in, in, in procurement savings. And that takes a while to, to turn around. Now, you say that that's solvable. What are some of the ways, if, if, if people are listening and they have that challenge within their organization, what are some of the ways that they can go about actually building trust in their savings numbers? Well, it, it's just about you know, adopting um, a decent framework for um, you know, reporting savings, let's say, from, from cradle to grave. So you start with a target, you then set your teams off to identify savings, you then start to negotiate savings, uh, you then close the deal, um, you then have the savings signed off, you then have to put the savings into the budget. Um, so, you know, there's a number of, of steps that a saving needs to, needs to travel down. Um, and, and along that route that the saving takes, um, there's leakage of savings, you know, out of the PL. And it's a case of really stemming that leakage by making sure we're very vigilant at, at every step um, and, 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 and making sure that we're working very closely with finance. Right? Yeah, That's right. where procurement needs to, needs to bring finance fully on board um, to be the owner of those savings and, and, and to vouch, to co-vouch for those savings. I've, I've, and, I've... And, and to work, sorry, to work with procurement throughout, you know, rather than popping your head up at the end of the year and saying, hey, well, you know, where are the savings? At that point, mm -hmm. it's too late. So it needs yeah. to be a constant engagement. Sorry, Simon. No, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I, I agree with all of that. I think what I would add in, it, in addition is that there needs to be a level of granularity as well. And I think that's where a lot of businesses can sometimes fall down is that the savings, the calculation is, is quite complex. And in the end, it's just, oh, it's 400K. Um, but we don't really, you know, the, the supplier ended up working it out for us and, you know, we don't have all the workings and it's not that anybody's trying to, to pull a fast one, um, but it's just that the, you know, uh, it sometimes requires a leap of faith to believe the savings. So really getting a granular uh, methodology, agreeing that methodology with your stakeholders and with finance before you really start the work to give it some credibility. Um, and then as Alex says, you know, you go through the process and then when you get to actually, um, having the final offers on the table or the final processes changes defined, you can then apply that savings methodology uh, and, and, and you can then, you know, there's granularity about how that number is built up. And, you know, we, we see that a lot, you know, it's, you know, it's no, no um, secret that we're a bunch of consultants here. We see that a lot with our clients um, in that, you know, when, when we come and, and help them, one of the things that really adds a lot of value to the procurement team initially to get credibility is, is how sort of data-driven and granular we, we are. Yeah, you know, from my experience as well, I, I've seen exactly the same, where you set out the, the savings methodology at the beginning, you get that approved by your stakeholder uh, and you get that approved by finance, then really all you're doing at the end of a project is you're applying that methodology and it's just exactly. a calculation, as opposed to a bun fight over, you know, what's valid and what's not valid and what should count and what shouldn't count. Uh, so you've done all that, you've taken care of that work before any number has ever been counted. So it's interesting because there's actually a lot to do in, in that space uh, around making that a process and make a process that works for finance and for procurement. Uh, in particular, just around the amount of rigor you put in, in your baselining work, in, in, in how you measure things. It's like, and, and here's the point that we, we have found several procurement organizations that, uh, you know, frankly, have checked out a little bit about the need for savings rigor. And, you know, they are very interested in, in, in starting to talk about non-savings factors that are equally as important and that we're obviously uh, also talking a lot about in the book. 
um, but they check out a little bit on savings to the point that they say, oh, I can't really do more to make this to become much more precise, much more aligned and much more rigorous. So it's it's something that also with 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 you know the ability to process data and and, and use technology is becoming um, you know is is becoming more possible for procurement teams to to do well and and something that that they you know they should definitely uh, embrace. Now we've talked about savings you know for the last five minutes or so. When you start with savings in the book, why is savings so important? And it seems like maybe it's a one-on-one -on -one question, but I think it's um, it's still important because it kind of sets a foundation. So I think you know if you look at the the stats on this, you know, CPOs, ninety-five percent of CPOs will say savings is is one of the key factors I'm measured on. But they will also say um, maybe not ninety-five, but they will say fifty, sixty percent of repeat themes for other aspects like mm -hmm. sustainability, etc. Obviously, when you want to embrace new objectives, that might, you know, that it, it's a bit harder sometimes to say, what does it mean? How do, how do I address sustainability? How do I do this? How do I do that? And so, you know, savings in a way is, it, it becomes a bit more of a, of a given, right? It becomes more of a, oh, you know, it's, it's not uncommon um, to, to, you know, when you're talking with, with CPOs for them to tell you like, oh, you know, savings, that's kind of last year's theme. It's, you know, we, we've we've well gone well beyond that, and it might be true, yeah. but um, maybe that is, you know, procurement teams talking to themselves because when you talk with everyone else, they say, well, uh, they they might say savings, but they might also say paper savings. What about you know, are these are these savings real? How do yeah. I see them? What trade offs did I do? Where do I get them, and what can I do about them? And so. What we're trying to 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 um, to do by maybe repeating that savings do matter is to say, you know, you, there's a lot to do in in other spaces and other priorities. But if you don't get this one right, and it's not easy to get it right, there's a commitment to rigor, to to you know, to working well with finance, to understanding your business. Everything else is is a little bit up in the air, yeah. uh, quite frankly. Now we got a question in advance and I see that we've got some questions as well coming in today. Uh, I just want to remind anybody who does have a question um, for the panel, please feel free to pop it into the Q&A um, and I will be bringing those in a little bit later today. We had a question in advance, which I think you kind of answered, but I want to at least ask the question um, because it's an interesting question from uh, Francois who asks, uh, a lot of the chapters in the book seem to be given over to savings and procurement. Is that really all the book's about? Yeah. Um, well, as we've said, it's definitely the first step, but it's not all this book is about. Um, you know, we, we, we do give over uh, uh, what we think is the right proportion of the book to, to savings and financial contribution, uh, or, or at least, you know, the, the typical savings definition of, of, of financial contribution. However, we also talk about operating model and, you know, how you need to set your procurement function up to make sure that it can not only generate some savings once, but actually sustain them and continue um, to generate them uh, you know, down the line. We also talk about supplier management as a really key area because you know, we see, um, as I'm sure a lot of people listening to this will, a big shift in, in, in the number of partners that businesses now use um, to make themselves successful. And so you know, the more you're kind of outsourcing to partners, the better you need to be at managing your supply base. And, you know, guess who is best positioned to help with that? Yeah, it's procurement. So we talk quite a bit about that. Um, and we also have a, a chapter given over to non, you know, non-savings priorities. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason we've done that is, you know, there are other things that procurement can and should uh, aspire to, as we said at, at the beginning, um, you know, whether it's sustainability uh, as a topic, which is growing in importance, um, you know, actually, sustainability is a great way for procurement to get on the radar of the CEO, because a lot of CEOs these days, literally in the last couple of years, it's become a massive topic for them. Um, and we also talk about, uh, you know, technology and, and the aspects governing, you know, how, how to get that right. Mm -hmm. um, it all links back to what is the value proposition of procurement, right. obviously, and, and a lot of these are kind of enablers for savings. But, but we, we, we definitely, you know, branch off to, to, to address those. Uh, and I'm going to yeah. come back to, to, sorry, go ahead, Alex. 
Yeah, no, I was just going to say, you know, another point, um, I mean, across all of these topics, whether it's savings, whether it's other procurement agendas, uh, whether it's working cross-functionally, whether it's sourcing, um, across, you know, a lot of these topics that the book, what the book is talking about is just good execution, right? Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of new theory here, fundamentally new ways of, of doing procurement, but rather it's about how do I execute that stuff well? How do I execute it optimally? How do I make it work cross-functionally? How do I make sure the savings do flow to the bottom line? Um, and so the, a, a lot of it is, is not, if you like, new theory, but rather sort of stories from the trenches. You know, yeah. what have we seen works well and doesn't work well in, in terms of doing procurement well and getting it executed? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's another big thing that runs a big theme that runs through the book is that procurement is mostly it's about good execution. The strategies are fairly obvious and fairly similar. The, what differentiates the really good companies from, from the not so good is, is how well do they execute. Mm. Yeah, and I actually want to bring it back to what Simon was saying earlier about vision as well. Is there's a kind of a, um, it, it, it's a mindset uh, that we need to address as procurement is what can the vision of procurement be in terms of the impact it has on the business and so we've talked about savings so far and savings kind of being that table stakes um, but that then enables you to do a lot of other things without that table stakes it may not enable you to go and do some of the more well I don't want to say more interesting but the stuff that are a little bit more uh, innovative from a procurement um, perspective but you get that in place and it gives you a lot more leeway to do a lot more interesting things and have a bigger impact on the business. Now, yeah, one of the things, sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna say definitely, and, and as I said, that's that's one of the, the deep dive themes we put um, on, you know, it, for example, aspects such as flexibility um, or, you know, even just setting your company to be a really good client for the supplier, mm -hmm. a really good in a sense of, a client that's demanding, but also, you know, makes them better suppliers, you know, is co-invested in testing things out and being innovative in, in getting more market intel. Um, these are all things that, you know, are, are um, great value adds and probably have a massive impact also on your own internal reputation, the ability to, to bring those, those ideas into the company to everyone. Uh, so, and we're saying that's, that's really critical. That's what we're talking about, the vision that's why we're, um, you know, giving, discussing the, the, the other, other, other priorities, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's critical. It's critical. Mm -hmm. to now we have a question that came in um, right at the beginning, Alex. You were talking about cross co cross collaboration being a big theme that runs through everything in the book. Um, a question that came in from Killian says that um, you know the book addresses the benefit of the procurement function adopting a service mindset. What would that look like in practice? So I just wonder if you could explain kind of you thinking of what a service mindset is and then yeah. some of the pra practical application of that. No, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, uh, and I guess the reason we're saying, you know, that it is, is other people's budgets and other people's operational needs and procurement is just a facilitator. Um, so, you know, in, in, in my mind, um, procurement needs to recognize that it's not in charge, but it's a service provider to help the business unit or to help the IT function or whoever it may be uh, to acquire what it needs, you know, stem the flow of money out of the company and to bring order to, you know, how, how money is spent. And companies had rules that said, you know, no, you can't buy anymore unless it goes through procurement. And then that fosters a culture of, well, we're the policemen, you know, you can't buy anything unless you yeah. go through us and unless, we do three quotes and you do it our way. Um, and, you know, that's the worst possible way to, to, to approach the relationship with the, with the stakeholder, because that's sure to, to get their backs up. But, you know, in, in many companies, in most companies, that's where procurement historically has come from. And it can be quite hard to sort of shake off those shackles uh, and adopt a more, a more humble approach. Um, the most successful procurement functions I've seen are, are very good and are very proactive and are not, um, you know, a passenger. Uh, they're very driven, mm -hmm. but, you know, from a position of recognizing that I'm the service provider here and, you know, yeah. the, the stakeholder is the boss and I have to 
impress these guys and I have to make them happy. That goes a hell of a long way. I'd say empathy, right? I mean, empathy is yeah. really getting yourself in, in, in your stakeholders' shoes and understanding like, what are the burning platforms they're living with? How can I help? You know, why are they saying this? You know, and also understanding what's the right timing to introduce a conversation, to introduce an idea and to, to, you know, to start something. So how would you recommend, you know, because I think that's, I'm certainly a big advocate of uh, alignment with business and, and, you know, creating a value proposition that compels your business to want to work with you, compels action, as opposed to turning up with a process or a policy and saying, this is what we do, because then that's when you end up being transactional and reactive versus very proactive. But there's kind of a fine line between um, turning up with a service delivery mindset and saying yes to everything. You know, there's that, that tension that you still need to be able to push back and challenge uh, and try and guide if you think the organization isn't making the right decision or your stakeholders not ma making the right decision. So I just wonder any tips on how you've seen the organizations do this best, how they kind of approach that tension, that natural tension that should exist. Yeah, yeah no, it's a really good point. And we do see that a lot. And the answer is not obvious, but one thing that helps, that does help is, is, is credibility and, and respect that you can earn with your, so for example, Let's say we've got an organization um, and, you know, procurement organization and there's a big marketing you know, department. I've often seen procurement people just get kind of swallowed into the marketing function just as the executor and not really able to influence anything. Um, and I think that can come from the fact that, you know, procurement is trying desperately to get a cost saving. And traditionally, that's not something that marketing is really incentivized on. You know, they're, they're incentivized on different things. And so the procurement person just ends up you know, running an, running RFPs or, or 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 coming in at the last minute with a with a deal. I think if you if if if, if the procurement function can um, position itself to really understand what the goals and the drivers are for the for the marketing function, as this in this example, um, and 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 start to kind of approach the conversations and the dialogue in that type of a language, we off you know we we found we've seen it work very well where you know people then start to ask. You know the procurement um, person for their for their opinion. You no, know, do does the, do, do they approve of this? Is this because they clearly get where I'm coming from? They clearly understand what I'm trying to achieve. But actually, having their kind of commercial rigor on this is is not a bad thing. So you know what what does this procurement person think? Um, but it is a fine line, right? You, you know, building that credibility and trust and not saying yes to everything is is difficult. Yeah, it's one of those things as well where I think you know show up with insights and data you know, in those first conversations. So those first conversations with your stakeholders are so key when they make a, um, an opinion on how you can help them. Yeah. And if you're, yeah. if you're not going in and bringing data and bringing some insights or something they may not have thought about before, then immediately they're going to think, well, yeah. procurement's just help, here to help me run a process. It's a big, it, sorry. sorry, go ahead, Julia. It's a big part of the CPO role too, um, in, in the sense that um, I think particularly the CPO, both through his team, but also through her, his or her team, and, and but also through the, the business stakeholder relationships is always to qualify what are topics that are procurements. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean by that, I, I own this part of the process that abstract away from the process, but what themes I can give you more advice on regarding, you know, how do suppliers react? What do I see in this type of circumstance? Like the credibility component also comes with, it might come with easing, which was your, your point, Phil, about sometimes procurement teams can get, can go native if they have too much of a surface delivery mindset. Um, but, it, you know, there, there's certain, certain, uh, certain insights, certain technical insights from a procurement standpoint, not with a jargon, but with, you know, basically adapted to whoever your interlocutor is that can really make a difference if people say, no, I'm getting commercial advice here. Maybe I'm, I'm still making my decision and, you know, mm. we're disagreeing, but I'm getting advice. Someone is giving me a good perspective. This is how suppliers react. This is, I can, it's perfectly legitimate for me to ask. They've even got uh, other insights that show that I, I could even get more of this. Sorry, Alex. Mm. Alex, did you want to jump in as well? No, no, I'm good. Thank you. All right. No, no I think that, um, yeah, that's, um, you know, at least they're making the decision with full, full information. 
And even if that information isn't the decision, they're not taking a decision that you may believe is the right decision. There are probably a number of reasons why that you might not be party to that decision is being made. And all you can do is give them you know, all the information that you, they, they can make that decision with. Now, Simon, I want to come to you about technology. You know, there's a chapter in the book about technology. Um, and you talk a little bit about um, the importance of technology, but perhaps we overstate the importance of technology as well. So I just wonder if you could share a little bit about your perspective there. Yeah, sure. So we actually, as, as a physio, we uh, did some research on, on this topic a couple of years ago, which we referenced in the book um, around technology and procurement. And, you know, there is, there has been a lot of hype about technology and the sort of things that it can, that it could do for procurement is AI, you know, smart analytics, you know, blockchain, these are the words that kind of get banded around. And there's no doubt that in future, th these things are going to have a profound impact on the way we do procurement. And, and so we need to acknowledge that. But, you know, in the book, we talk much more about the dangers of getting caught up in that hype. Um, if you you know, don't understand your data, for example, um, in terms of, you know, spend contracts. Um, and so what we do in the book is talk a little bit about this, this concept of a steam powered Tesla, um, right. which is, you know, the, the Tesla is the, the, the high end, sophisticated um, engine, you know, car, uh, which is the, the tool, but if it's just fed with, um, with steam, uh, i.e. poor data, then it's not going to go anywhere. You might as well just get a Ford um, and you'd probably go further. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we make that point and, and kind of and have that analogy, uh, but we give some practical tips about what we've seen work well in companies um, around, you know, using technology also as a knowledge management tool. Um, and, you know, the technology for this has been around for a couple of decades at least. It's not new technology, but, you know, companies that can use technology to make them, as I should say, procurement organizations that can use technology um, to make themselves more scalable um, through the way that they, you know, manage and curate knowledge um, are ones that have an advantage. You know, or, procurement organizations that can use technology to have, you know, accurate data, you know, um, recent data, uh, you know, ideally real time, but just recent data uh, are the ones that are best position to actually make data-driven decisions. And those decisions are often better than the ones made, you know, with a hunch, um, you know, off the hoof. So we, we, we really, we, we do talk a little bit about the new technologies that are coming, um, but we, we kind of say that, you know, rather, um, you know, unfortunately, it's not very sexy, but a lot of the technology that could make a huge difference today has already been around for, for, for 20 years or so. Um, and uh, I would say that the, you know, when we talk about the future of procurement uh, in the technology chapter, we also draw on the analogy of, of the US agents um, who used to be the ones when you wanted to book a holiday back in the 90s, you had to go to an agent uh, and tell them what you wanted. It was a bit of a cumbersome process. They'd be checking for you. Um, these days, as consumers, we can just do all of that ourselves mm -hmm. yeah, under so much visibility online. Um, and we think that it could be the same fate awaiting procurement if it doesn't change the way it does things and you know it, they, they could become the agents you know they need to be first to the party in terms of making the customer journey the end user journey easier um, and and so we think that technology is going to play a very important role uh, going forwards but there's a lot we can do from a basic standpoint today mm -hmm. and, and technology just needs to be used judiciously right Unfortunately, what we, what we still see a hell of a lot is companies where, where we go in and, and the CTO declares, well, we've bought all the software out there. We've spent all the money. We've bought all the tools. That's all we've done. Um, and the tools sit there and nobody knows how to use them. There's no process that they can plug into. There's no data, as Simon says, to feed into the tool. You know, the number of companies I've seen with an with a all singing, all dancing contracts repository yeah. but there's no contracts in there mm. um, and that seems to be you know pretty much the norm so there's still a tendency of, for people to rush out buy the software thinking that it's a silver bullet and then spend you know five years trying to make it work um, I, I think what we're saying is you know figure out the operating model figure out the people equation figure out how you're going to work across the organization and then put the technology in right. the right places at the right time 
Yeah, so in that approach, you know, it doesn't need to be an expensive or time consuming approach either, does it? It's kind of selecting the right technologies and the right tools for the right moment and then using that as the business case to then continue to invest as you're seeing the impact of the technology that you're putting in place. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But there, there is, but there is, I mean, Alex makes a very good point about, you know, the temptation to go and buy, buy tools and technology. And, you know, when, when we, we, you know, we, we put it in the book, we reference it, but when we did the research, we found that, you know, 50% of CPOs openly admit to buying technology just because they're afraid of missing out and missing the boat. Um, you know, and that's quite a dangerous state of affairs, um, you know, as opposed to buying it because of a business case um, and because you understand what benefit you're going to get from it. So it's a very, a real minefield, the whole technology piece, but hopefully in the book, we've, We've tried to just give some of those practical tips that I, that I mentioned there to, to help get the most out of the technology that's out there. Um, now, again, I want to encourage anybody to ask any questions, pop those in the Q&A today. Um, I have a question which um, really there's a couple of folks that ask a, a similar question, Robert and Stephen, um, and it's actually related to direct procurement. The question is that the use of technology in indirect procurement is now pretty mainstream. But why do you think it's not as well developed? Or there's perhaps not as many options in the direct procurement space? I think it's yep. more... Sorry, sorry, go ahead, Jose. I think it's, it's an area that's more fragmented and more business specific, and it requires much more customization. Uh, and, and this is, you know, this is precisely, I think, going back to the point that Simon was mentioning about your data approach. And, and how you leverage data. Because what, what, what happens in, in direct is if you're looking at an area like claims and insurance, or if you're looking at an area like um, you know, a goods for resale, um, you have to be much more aware of what your data allows you to do. And, and um, the, the logic that you can find a piece of technology uh, off the shelf without some level of customization in direct, um, it's hard to find those type of this type of solutions from a technology standpoint. So again, I'd say that's a perfect example. In indirect, there are a lot of things that just because of the repeatability and the fact that everyone has indirect, um, there are certain solutions that that just just work well. They they sort out a lot of problems. But in indirect, you 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 need to have your own strategy really. And there are some exceptions, but generally that's it. Everyone has to have their own approach. Yeah. Now, um, one of the chapters in the book is about private equity. And private equity kind of flows, I think, through some of the chapters. And it's interesting that you kind of called out one um, industry as, um, you know, so prominently in the book. Alex, I just wonder if you could share why that is, you know, and, and, and why private equity featured so heavily. Cool. Um, well, the reason the chapter's there is that um, about half of Efficio's revenue comes via private equity companies. So half our revenue comes from uh, large industrial blue chips. The other half comes through um, the leading PE houses, with many of whom we have very strong relationships. And they put us into their portfolio companies um, to optimize procurement. And um, it's really just a case study because what we've learned from that experience is that procurement and private equity are just a, a really great match. Yeah. Um, for starters, private equity is all about, uh, you know, growing the company value. And the way to do that, of course, is, is, is to grow the EBITDA. And private equity can see the potential in procurement and views procurement as a relatively easy way um, to get some runs on the board in terms of profit improvement while they make other broader changes um, to the company. So, you know, PE is, is a big fan of procurement and will uh, create a platform for procurement to stand up and, and, and deliver because it's, it's, it's very powerful as far as PE is concerned. Um, and then, you know, once you get going in a private equity company, uh, what you realize is that the PE company is actually in a, in a great position to help you along the way as well. Um, so, you know, we talked about how companies are functionally siloed and how you need to operate cross-functionally. Well, private equity people are, by definition, you know, cross-functional agents. Um, mm -hmm. One of their people will be parachuted into the executive team of the company, and that person can act as the cross-functional glue and can act as the champion for procurement 
with the CFO, with the heads of the business units, with the head of the, of the technical functions. Um, and so, you know, it can be done more quickly and be, and be more successful if, if you have the PE, PE partner on your side providing that sponsorship. Um, so, you know, we just find time and again, when there's a private equity owner that understands procurement and, and, and is up for the challenge, then procurement can do, you know, really great things. So the, the chapter is there to say, you know, look, here's an example of what you can do. Um, in private equity, oftentimes you start from nothing. There's, you know, these are mid-cap companies. There's no procurement function or a very weak procurement function. And within 18 months, you can put a function in and, and you can make, you know, a big dent in, in, in profitability. Um, and the lesson learned for everyone else is it's about sponsorship. It's about giving that platform and it's about making the thing cross-functionally cohesive. And that just works very well in, in, in PE. And that glue that you talked of, that's kind of the, the takeaway for um, you know, non-PE. If you're in a, a procurement function thinking about how we make a difference, you know, having, being able to position someone in that role that can do all the connect that is basically that connectivity is really what's driving a lot of the impact. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, now, I want to come uh, in a, a couple of minutes here just to talk a bit generally about the book writing process. But um, we had a couple of questions from um, one from Tom and one from William, and and they're both asking questions around the topics that we've talked about today. You know, going from. Uh, essentially a tactical function as, of procurement to one that is strategic and a driver of cross-functional change. So rather than asking kind of the specific questions, and I'm going to open this to all of you, you know, are there things in the book that perhaps we haven't talked about today that you think is really important that, uh, you know, are in, uh, that were important to you during the writing process that you really wanted to get across to readers? Yeah, you mean you mean certain certain aspects of the book in terms of the, yeah. the topics, Phil? Yeah, if there's things yeah. that we haven't talked about today, but you think you know would be really it's it's important for people who are listening in and watching in today to yeah um, to know about. Yeah, I think I think one that I can think of is a, around team. So we haven't spent a lot of time today talking about team and skills, mm -hmm. but one of the things that we we talk about in the the chapter on people, which is early on in the book, is um, trying to get away from this idea that everybody who, you know, all your candidates for your procurement function need to have procurement experience um, is something that we, we try to um, show an alternative way. And, you know, one of the key things we talk about is the, the importance of having a diverse skill set. Yeah. Um, and, and, and we find that if you just go and, 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 and fish in this fairly small pool of people who have procurement experience and, and that's not to say that people who have procurement experience are not good people they are um but it, it's the pool is not big enough and and it's it, and everybody's fishing in the same pool so you know we find that there are other ways there are other types of profiles you know um in particular skills around you know data analytics the, you know the way that you can communicate all these things exist in other people as well not just those people who have procurement experience so that's that's a key thing we give some tips on on how to put a team together um, uh, and the kind of important aspects of that. And I think anybody who, who might be listening, who, who is thinking about, you know, what the, the makeup of their team, whether it's the right balance mix, would probably benefit from reading that chapter in particular. Jose, anything that comes to mind for you? Um, I think one, one, one interesting one is, is around the roadmap and how to get started and how to basically, you know, think how you can reposition and you can really be an enabler for cross-functional change, right? So um, I, I would say uh, there, 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 there are several practical tips, but I think really what, 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 what it can boils down to is, is write things down, try to raise the commercial IQ of, of, of your counterparties, try to, you know, um, try, to, try to articulate what you need, what's good, ideas you have, try to, um, Try to bring it all up and structure in a plan, and try to you know to to be, be ready to say what you need to thrive. And I think um, there's a, a chapter on 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 getting started on the roadmap, and and really it gives several tips about what what probably you need to articulate, what you need to to um, um, to bring to your sponsor, to 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 the exec, 
um, to, you know, basically to make sure that everyone understands what you can do, what you need, and what you can achieve. Um, that's, I th I'd say that's one, one, one topic we didn't cover, the, the, the need to write it down, to communicate, to be, to sell um, uh, not only what you can deliver and self-promote what you've already done, but what are your enablers? Mm -hmm. um, and Alex, I'm gonna, you had a little bit of time to think there while, uh, while Simon and, and Jose were put on the spot. Anything from your perspective that uh, you really wanna bring out from the book for listeners? Yeah, I mean, one thing we try to bring out throughout the book is um, kind of a back to basics message, right? A lot of it is about improving your execution, improving how you work cross-functionally. And that's the thing that it's a continuous improvement thing that takes, that takes many years. I've met so many procurement leaders who've told me, yeah, we got the category management methodology from consultancy X. Mm -hmm. We got the seven step sourcing process from consultancy Y. We've implemented it. We've got the handbook done. Now we're on to the next thing, you know, revenue generation. Yeah. Um, and, and that's where this thinking comes from, you know, in terms of savings that says, you know, stop. You haven't tick marked the savings piece and, and, and you're done with that. It's a, it's a multi-year endeavor. So keep working on that, keep improving how you execute, keep improving how you're viewed by the other functions and how you work with them. Um, and, then, and then the rest will follow. Mm -hmm. um, now we had a question that came in from Tanvi who asks, and this is specifically to, to a physio, but I think that the context, we can also apply this to just more generally from a procurement transformation perspective. The question is when companies reach out to a physio, do they already know the importance of procurement or does a physio need to come in and show the C-suite why it deserves a place at the table. And, you know, as I think about this broader, it's more, do transformations start from within procurement or they, do they start from outside of procurement? Yeah, I, I saw the question. I thought it was a really good one. Um, so I think if a company is reaching out to us, then obviously there is already some spark, uh, some something that, that, that tells them that actually procurement could help them here. Um, in my experience, we, we do have to, with the procurement function, in most cases, do um, a selling job on the value of procurement, but it's, it can't be done in a presentation uh, or a pitch. You know, it really is done over, 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 over months, and it's very incremental in my experience. I don't know whether Jose and Alex have a different experience, but um, you, know, the, the, you know, the CFO or the CEO might buy into the initial scope of what they've asked for, which is maybe some savings against budget. Um, but then through that work, they start to see actually, you know, procurement, you know, we're seeing that procurement can be much, much larger than this. And, and that's, that's where, you know, the really kind of successful companies uh, that, that deploy procurement well um, are found in those ones that kind of see, go on that journey and, and end up seeing the, the, the prize. But it's not something that can be done in my experience, just in a, like in a pres in one presentation that needs to be seen and experienced. Now we had a question, we've, it's probably a question which could take a 10 minute answer and we've only got a couple of minutes uh, to ask it that came through in the chat from Tom um, saying, based on your experience, does procurement have the right amount of talent to drive the changes you recommend in the book? Or is there a gap that should be closed to facilitate this transition? You know, what's the role of consultants in that process? So generally in the market, I would not say that there is enough talent, um, you know, uh, working a lot, for example, in the US where the national hero is always a salesman, mm -hmm. um, you know, the procurement man doesn't exist, but um, is, is not, is definitely not a hero. And, and so as a consequence, people find, they don't go look for procurement, procurement finds them, right? Um, so there is, there is a talent gap and, and, um, and I think that's, the, the, the consultants are our solution. Again, we, we also speak, we also give our, our experience about how, what, how to make the most out of consultants. But I think also the ability to, to upskill and to have a plan around talent, around how you develop people uh, and how you make it an attractive proposition internally to work with procurement um, is, is probably what has to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, most, um, I'd say. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, there, there is a talent gap, right? And, and because there's two types of talent required, there's the, there's the procurement technical capability, and then there's the softer skills that you need in order to 
you know, work across the organization as, as we've been talking about. Um, and, and those softer skills are often um, not there or there isn't enough of a, of a um, you know, enough importance placed on those, on those soft skills. But they're critical because, you know, procurement people in many ways are like consultants. Um, they have to work with the rest of the business to make something happen, um, almost like an advisor. Um, and, you know, so they need to have very good influencing and, and, and persuasion skills. That's absolutely critical. And that's probably the, the, the biggest missing piece. Now, I know we're coming up to the last couple of minutes. I had a couple of questions, uh, quick fire, just related to the writing process itself. Um, how long did it actually take to write the book? I'm sure, you know, you've all been, uh, as I think Simon, you said at the beginning, didn't really have a lot of places to go during the <laughs> pandemic. Um, so have you been shutting yourself in a room, uh, you know, for six months or nine months to put this together? What did that look like? Yeah, go on, um, Alex. <laughs> well, I guess how long did it take overall? The actual writing, probably about three months. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, you know, we had to slot it in along with our along with our day jobs. Um, but essentially, we yeah, we broke the book down into chapters and and themes, divvied them up, and then um, and then off we went. But yeah, it was about about three months' work, uh, all in all. Um, you know, what I would say is what I found amazing during the writing process is that, um, you know, when you have, like me, 28 years of experience in the field, you do accumulate a lot of know-how that you're not even aware of. Yeah. Um, and, when, and when you start writing a chapter on a particular topic, you know, the, the knowledge is all there. So that the, 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 the challenge of writing the book was really one of not getting the knowledge, but how do we organize it and how do we structure it and structure it in a, in a readable way? So I have a follow-up question. I'm going to direct this to you, Alex, because this comes from Michelle, who um, for listeners is Alex's wife. And I'm not <laughs> sure in what context she is asking this question. The question is, is there going to be a second book? And I'm not sure if it should be yes, the answer to that for the time away writing or whether that should be a no. <laughs> Sounds like a loaded question coming from my wife, so I'll, I'll probably pick this one up offline with her. <laughs> um, the, the very final one, and hopefully this is the easy question, uh, and I'll pose this to you, Alex, as well. Uh, where can viewers today, um, and anyone who may be listening to this as well, where can they uh, go and actually pick up the book for themselves if, they, uh, if today's session has piqued their interest? Yeah, very easy. You can go to the Fisio Consulting website. We have a landing page for the book there. Uh, you can buy it through there or you can just go direct to Amazon um, and buy it off, off Amazon. It takes two minutes. Perfect. And as you can see from the images behind all the authors, it's profit from procurement. Um, just pop that into to Amazon or go to the Fisio site, as Alex said, and you'll find it there. Well, we're coming to the top of the hour. So Simon, Jose, Alex, thank you for inviting me to, to host. It's, it's a big day for you all, the, all, all the time that you've put into writing this book um, and being able to launch it here virtually. Um, so thank you. And um, thank you everybody for attending and joining us today.